All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Liz. If you don't already know me, I used to work with On One much more often than I do now, and then I transferred over into a professional photography career. And so I come back every once in a while and do a little bit of teaching to help you guys out and learn a little bit more about what it's like to be out in the fields and how to process your photos. Um, in the last year and a half, I think, since I left On One, almost two years now, um, I have been working exclusively as a photographer, retoucher, and trainer. And that's pretty much all I do nowadays. Um, and it's actually, the training part is one of my favorite parts because I've learned a lot in the last couple of years about photography, not just the fun photo shoot side of it, which is what everybody likes, um, but also the business side of things and the organizational side of things. So we're going to be talking about importing, organizing, and editing a photo shoot today. And I really want to make sure that I say this a couple of times. We as photographers are naturally creative people. And unfortunately, naturally creative people have a tendency to not be naturally organized. I don't know if I'm the only one, but most of the kids that I went to school with, most of the photographers that I teach nowadays, I have a um, a college student right now that I'm mentoring and I'm trying to help her through and she doesn't understand a lot of this. She wants to go out and shoot and she forgets about the after. What happens when you come home and you have to actually do all of the work on the computer? And so I'm hoping that today, while you guys have come home from all of your photo assignments and all the fun that you've been having, hopefully I can help you get a little bit more organized at home. And that's one of the things that's really, really important when you're a photographer is being able to do this kind of stuff. So we're going to go over today, we're going to be going over, uh oh, hold on guys, for some reason we are running out of, my keyboard has stopped working, so let me go ahead and uh, fix that really quick, there we go, that's a little better, okay, so we're going to be going over all of this organizational work today. And I want to start at the beginning, when you get home importing your files. Now, I am a freak organizer, which means that I went from completely not organized at all to realizing that I was totally unorganized. And I had clients asking me for photos and asking me where their images were and I couldn't find them. I was having a difficult time accessing them. I didn't know where I put them. It was one thing after another and it was really, really tough. And I had a realization about two years ago that I really needed to get my stuff together and I needed to figure out how to organize everything so that I could find things easier. I didn't want clients freaking out that they didn't know where their files were. So importing is really important because it's how you get your files from your camera onto your computer. Now, the thing about browse, and we're not going to be doing a ton of importing information here because browse is not an importing or cataloging program and that's one of the reasons why it's so great. You can access your images and view them organize them, rate them, create folders way faster because you're not dealing with the process of having to catalog all of your images and create all of these thumbnails that go along with the images that already exist on your computer. So you can pick an import method of your choice. Um, you can use image capture, which you'll see on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, that's what I usually use because that's what I have on my computer and it's really easy. I plug my camera in and bam, I import them. Um, you really want to make sure that you pick a good spot for your photos. I create folders ahead of time. So you'll notice that there's a little red square at the bottom of this slide and it's import to. And I've already created a folder for all of these wedding files where they're going to go. So I don't have to worry about putting them in my picture folder and then figuring out where they're going to go afterwards. So pick a spot and create a folder ahead of time. I can't tell you how many photographers I talk to that do not do this. So get your folder ready before you import. Also, I shoot a lot of weddings, and weddings can range from 3,000 to 6,000 photos depending on how large it is and what they're looking for. So get ready to wait. It doesn't matter what way you import files, you're probably going to end up sitting there for a little while. So it's really, really important that you, you're willing to be patient and spend a little time just kind of hanging out. Now the importing, that's going to be really, really simple. Get your photos on your computer or your hard drive so that you're ready to go. The organizational side of things is the part that I am really excited to talk about today, which is very nerdy and I'm totally okay with that. When you're organizing your images, you want to prep your folders before your import and during your import. 
So while you're waiting for all of your images, I suggest that you spend some time trying to figure out where these files are going to go. Now, every single one of my wedding couples has a named folder. So you'll see on the top right-hand corner there's wedding couple, and I've uh, highlighted with that red box the name of the couple. So it's Jackie and Tom. Then I create categories for all of the different actions that happened that day. Some couples will have more and others will have less, so pay attention to that. But I like to separate all of my files down because it's easier for them to go through their images if I separate them down into categories, and it's easier for me. Looking at 6,000 photos on your computer and not knowing where to start, I've done that before, and it stinks. So categories, categories, categories. They're going to save your butt, and it's also going to give you breaks in your editing time. So if I get through ceremony pictures today, I'll go through decoration files tomorrow, and it gives me an idea of how much time I'm going to need to spend, and I'm not looking at thousands of photos all at once. So I highly suggest that you do this kind of folder tree that I'm showing you on the top right-hand corner here. And then the file types, I separate everything down into different folders inside each folder. You guys are probably sitting there thinking I'm crazy, but I promise this method is awesome. Um, I have a file with all of the edits, particularly the ones that I have to retouch. I have a file folder for my JPEGs, which are web ready, and then I have a folder for my print ready files. Then when a client asks me, hey, do you have that bridal party shot? It's of me and so and so. Um, I got the JPEG version of it, but I can't find the print version anywhere. Would you mind sending that to me? I know exactly where it's going to be. And part of the reason why I know that is also because of unique file names. A lot of people leave their file names the way that they are or use a date-based sequence. I use file names kind of like the way that people use keywords. I want to be able to find my files easily and quickly. So unique file names, really, really, really important. And when I work with wedding couples or even, I mean, senior shoots, anything along those lines, I have a very simple way of doing it. It's the couple name or the person's name at the front, the category, the date, and the sequence. Now, they end up looking like long file names, but trust me, when you type in somebody's last name or you type in senior because you're looking for senior photos for a portfolio review, you're going to be able to find those files a lot faster than if you left them at their unique names. So organization is really, really important. And we're going to be going into more of this as we get into Browse. Now, once you go through all the organizational steps, you're going to get to the fun part, which is editing. And I love this part. It's great. But the organization has to come first, so trust me. Now, when you're editing, you want to make sure that you pay attention to the portraits that are going to need retouching first. I get those out of the way so that I don't have to worry about them. I've been really lucky. A lot of the wedding clients that I've had have not wanted a lot of high-end retouching, but a couple of the ones I have been requested to do a little bit more retouching on certain people. And it never bothers me. I love retouching, but I always make sure I do those first so that I can eventually create presets that I can batch process through. I don't want to batch process a preset on a photo and then have to go back and retouch. It's kind of counterintuitive. So start with your portrait retouching first. If you don't really need to do a lot of that, then jump into preset mode. Now, preset folders are the best kept secret of on one effects, seriously. I can't believe people don't use them as much as I do. Um, you'll see on the right hand side, I've pointed out with little arrows a lot of the different categories that I've used for my presets. You'll see that there are the couple's initials, so A and J wedding, uh, L and T wedding, P and M wedding. So each one of those are the wedding presets that go with that couple. And then I also have a couple like party presets. I do a lot of events, so I have a whole section just for party presets that look great with things like Flash. And I've got a lot of horseback riding. So if you've ever spent any time watching me do uh, tutorials or webinars or anything like that, you know that I take a lot of pictures of horses. That's one of my favorite side businesses. And I have a lot of specific presets that go along with that. And then inside each category, I'm very specific about the name of the presets. So for the AJ wedding presets. I've got a couple for the ceremony. I've got some for getting ready, including black and white and color. I've got a black and white for reception. So each one of those is unique to a time of the day. And I know exactly which preset goes with which part of my afternoon. A lot of times I copy these presets and I actually keep them in the wedding folder. So sometimes you'll see in some of my folders there will be a preset folder and that's me making sure that I have a backup of all of these presets that I have access to. So, a lot of information 
all together. The last thing that I want to say is there's actually a secret fourth step here, and that's going to be exporting. We're not going to go over a ton of exporting, but I wanted to give you guys a head up. This is heads up. This is your end point. This is where you're going to go after all of this process, which actually does take quite a while. You're going to end up here with exporting. And presets, oh my gosh, presets. This is my favorite thing about the export feature is that I can save the export settings and reuse them so they do not have to type them in individually every time. It, it's a lifesaver. So right in the kind of center you'll see that it's the menu of all of the different presets that I have. You'll see that there's a web watermark JPEG preset. That's what I use when I'm exporting for things like clients who want to put images up on their Facebook pages, if I want to put something up on a blog post, like I want to make sure it's watermarked. And then right up at the top, you'll also see print export. Um, that's my files. I usually size photos for about an eight and a half by 11 for a lot of my clients. And that's my base print export. In the middle is also one of my favorites. It's called recently used edit. It's the last preset that I used, so the most recently used preset that was just used in effects, applied in an edit. So that's kind of the base for what that is. Now, web safe versions with watermarks are really, really important to be created so clients can upload their images easily. And then print specific versions can be created really easily. That depends on how you like to run your business. I create print specific versions for pretty much all of my clients because I don't run a printing service. So I charge specifically knowing that they're probably gonna print their own files. Um, I don't really have a print set up at home and some people do. So it all depends on what you like to do. Um, so that's kind of the basis for what we're going to be talking about today. And let's go ahead and get started here. All right. So we're going to jump right into browse. And we're going to go into understanding the import. Now, a lot of times people get really confused with what importing is. And a lot of people have a uh, difficulty understanding the whole cataloging system and what we do and don't do. There is no basic, easy option for me to import my files in Browse. And that's actually a really specific thing. The way that Lightroom works and the way that catalogs work is you're culling all of your images, you're cataloging them together, you're creating thumbnails, and you're creating previews of all of those files. Now, we don't do that. We access the raw file itself on your hard drive, and then you look at that file. Lightroom is kind of creating what I like to call a mimic of your photo, and that's what you're viewing in Lightroom. And the cataloging process takes a long time. It's gotten a lot faster, but for me, it's still really, really obnoxious. So when I import, a lot of times I use this program called Image Capture, and that's on my computer. There's a very comparable version on Windows if you guys are using Windows, so don't worry about the fact that Image Capture is not on your computer. Most computers have some sort of import program. A lot of times when you plug a camera into Windows, a dialog automatically pops up and asks if you want to import them, which is really awesome. Here, a lot of people, Image Capture will pop up or Lightroom will pop up. I never, ever, ever use Lightroom to import because it catalogs and imports at the same time, and it takes forever. So if you want to stay staring at your computer while you wait for 6,000 images to catalog, um, even if you break it down on 16 gigabyte cards, you're going to be waiting there for hours, hours. And if you're like me and you shoot a lot of weddings and you shoot a lot of high-end shoots where you've got hundreds and hundreds of images, waiting sucks. So image capture is really fast. It's really easy. You can select the folder that you want to import it to. You can get all of them in the same place, and you're good to go. Now, once you've imported a folder, finding it in Browse is where we're going to be moving on to next. And if you have any questions about the import process, please let me know. The only reason that we're kind of talking about it is that I want to be able to show you guys how fast it is to be able to view your photos here because we're not we're not doing this cataloging business. Now, once you've got your images on your computer, that's when the organizational work begins. We're going to start out by making sure that you have folders that make sense. Now, this sounds really stupid, and I think a lot of you guys are probably laughing at me right now. You're like, of course I have folders that make sense. The number of times that I look on someone's computer and they have files 
that are just all willy-nilly in folders that have no names or weird names, like winter 2015. Um, well, what part of winter? Uh, what day did you take these on? Is it all of the photos from winter? Is it a certain photo shoot that you did? I mean, there's like a million different things that that could be. It's fascinating. And to me, I like to make sure that I know where everything is and what everything is so that it's easy to find. I have way too many photos nowadays to let them get lost. And that's one of the big things that I've realized, especially in the last year, is I've had a couple clients ask me for photos, and there have been a handful of times where I had a hard time finding them. And that's not acceptable. If you're not working on a client basis, um, like I am, you're doing this more for fun, maybe searching your, for your photos is a really fun game. But for me, it is really important that if someone asks me where an image is, I can go, yes, I know where it is. It might take me a little while to get to it because I'm really busy, but I know where it is. Um, one of the recent examples is I had a senior photo client, this girl named Hannah. She's really, really nice. She wanted to see if there were any other pictures of her and her horse. I only processed a couple. She wanted to see if there were more. I knew exactly where they were and in which folder, and I knew where to find them and how easy it is. So it's really important that you give your files or your folders good names. Um, so we're going to start out and I want to talk to you a little bit about what, what subfolders I use. A lot of times when I'm working with weddings, I'm going to jump into a wedding folder really quick so you guys can take a look. Here's this couple, Alex and Bernice. I only did a wedding for them, so I know exactly who they are. You'll notice that right next to them, Ari and Jamie have a wedding and an engagement. I did them back to back, so it's important that I differentiate there. Um, but this couple, I just did their wedding. So we're going to go ahead and jump in here. And you'll see that there are six different folders here. Every single client that I work with has different subfolders that I separate their images into for easier access for me. If I was looking for a reception photo, I believe for this client I took about 500 or 5,500 photos on and off. If I'm looking for a reception photo and I don't know where to find it and it's not in a subfolder, I'm going to go insane. So for this couple, they were unique to them. You'll see that bridal party, ceremony, decorations, getting ready, reception, those are all really basic. But you'll also notice that there's a separate subfolder over here called Laurelhurst and family. This is really specific to that couple, so everything is malleable. There's a, there's a basic system that you can expand off of. These five right here, the ones that I just repeated, bridal party, ceremony, decorations, getting ready, reception, those are the five categories that I use for pretty much every client. But a lot of times things like speeches, if they're really into doing like crazy speeches and they want pictures of that, um, that might go in a separate folder. If I want to separate all of the specific family shots, those might go in a separate folder instead of putting them in bridal party, which gets confusing. So for me, being able to put them into subfolders is really, really important. Every single client is different, but it's also really important to note that a lot of these photo shoots have subfolders. It's not just weddings here. So I just photo photo I just photographed a horse show recently. And to most people, that sounds crazy. Um, horse shows for me are a lot of fun to photograph. I really miss shooting sports. It, it was one of my favorite things when I was younger, and I don't get to do it very often. Um, but I do go back and I photograph horse shows, especially for a lot of the girls that I work with. Um, and if we jump into the horse show folder, you'll notice that there are four subfolders, and it's each one of the girls that I followed and photographed for those two days. Each one of those days is in those folders. Each one of those girls will get their own photos separately after I finish editing them, and so I don't have to worry about where they were and when. Every single girl had rounds on every single day, so I had to go through and make sure that I put them in those folders. But now I don't have to go through a catalog of images and say, all right, so that's uh, Megan, and that's Megan, and scroll down, and that's Megan, and that's Megan, and oh crap, where's the rest of Megan? Which sounds kind of bizarre, but it's really, really helpful. Um, again, the number of photographers that don't do this is insane, and to me, it makes so much sense because I'm working with clients who want their photos, and I'm working with myself, who I know can get confused very easily. So if I can't find a file, I freak out, and especially now that I'm disorganized about my file trees and how my files are accessed, if I can't find a file, it might be gone um, because I am very, very good at how I organize my images. So, 
don't just say that this is for weddings. A lot of times people assume that these photo shoots, especially that I'm talking about, are weddings only. This is for any type of shoot that you do. Another really, really good example of something, I just shot this. It's a photo shoot for some friends of mine, and they wanted these very, very cheesy 80s style photos to be up in their office, in their new work office. And I took a whole bunch of photos for them, and I haven't, I literally haven't even gone through and categorized them yet. But there's a whole bunch of different group photos and individual photos. And I just uploaded these the other day, and I'm going to be going through and separating them down into the group photos that they're going to want printed and then the individual photos that I'm going to have to Photoshop together. Um, and so that's another really important category is images that are going to need a lot more Photoshopping, so maybe multiple images that will get combined together, and then a lot of photos that could be easily batch processed. Um, so there's a lot of different examples for how you can use this method. Now, the other thing that is really, really important when you're doing this is renaming your files. Most of these files, unless they're recently uploaded in the last couple of weeks, not even, in the last week or two, um, most of these files have very unique file names. And as you saw in the slideshow, it's very important to me to put a keyword in there so that I can find it easily. Um, Hannah's Senior Photos is a great example of a unique file name that isn't wedding based. It's her name and then it says Senior. So it's Hannah, Senior, the date, and the sequence number. So if I typed in Senior and I was looking for a whole bunch of senior photos for a new web gallery that I was creating, I would find not just hers but all of the other senior photo clients. If I was looking for pictures of this girl, Megan, who I shoot at horse shows, I did some photos of her and her horses at home, and I'm looking for her, I would type in her name and I would find her very easily. And it's because all of her photos have the same slug at the beginning. It's got her name, what I did, it's got the date and a sequence number. So you can choose whatever works best for you, but my basic is the name of the client or maybe the last name of the client, something that is client named based, the category, the date, and the sequence. And that's for all of these. Um, it doesn't matter what folder we jump into, you're going to be able to see this in all of the images that I click on. For these images of this girl Megan, it's Meg the horse that she was, uh, I was photographing her with, the date, and the sequence. So it's really, really easy for me to find the files that I need. And all of the files that have her have Meg, whatever her category is, and the sequence. So hopefully I'm not boring the pants off of you guys. Um, but this, this organizational work is really, really insanely important. Um, now I wanted to show you guys really quickly if you don't know how to rename your files in Browse, it's actually really easy. So if we go through and let's say, for example, we want to rename a whole bunch of these wedding files. I left them unnamed for you guys, which let me just tell you was extremely difficult not to uh, rename these files. It's like every part of my being was cringing that I hadn't renamed these already because it drives me crazy now when things aren't, aren't properly organized. So I have all of these files. I want to rename them. It's really important that they're in a specific order, so make sure at the bottom of Browse, when you're looking at all of your files, you open up this drop-down menu, it's the sort. It allows you to sort your files by a specific uh, category. I always do date captured. I always like to make sure that, particularly for things like ceremony and reception, that all of those files are one right after the other in correct chronological order. If you were looking at your wedding photos and you were looking at reception photos from the end of the night, and let's just, let's be honest, there's a whole bunch of your friends and family that are probably have been drinking and are dancing and look very ridiculous, and then it jumps to the beginning of the reception before everybody started drinking and everyone looks really pleasant, and then it goes back to it, and you're like, what just happened? If your files aren't chronologically ordered, you're going to drive you're going to drive your clients crazy. Um, I did that once, and I will never make that mistake again because I ended up having to re-put everything in order because I didn't pay attention to the order. This was years ago, one of the first weddings that I did. I didn't pay attention to how things were organized, and it wasn't great. So always make sure that your files are sorted by date captured. When you're working with things like decorations, it may not be as important. A lot of these are just photos of the decorations that were in the reception hall, and so it's not quite as important, but it's still something that I like to make sure I point out.
Now, if you want to rename a whole bunch of files, just Controller Command A, select all of the images, go up to the Edit menu, and choose Rename Files. It's going to open a little dialog box, and you have a lot of options for what you can do current name, text, and serial number. So if you want to keep the current name in there, if that's really important to you, you can go for it. I like to put in text. That's important to me. So this couple is Alex and Bernice. So their slug is AB. And the underscore, this would be decorations. Their wedding was on the 22nd of August. So 0822216. And then we'll put one more underscore. So that's going to be the text at the beginning of the file. And then at the end, we'll put the serial number. The really cool thing about the serial number, you can choose how many zeros you want. Um, I like four or five, depending on how many photos I have. I work with thousands of images. So for me, I use five a lot. Um, Even if there aren't a thousand images that are in a specific category, I'd actually say 50% of the time that's not true, Um, especially with bridal party photos. I take a lot, and reception photos, I take a lot. Um, So you can choose how many numbers you want. If you're working with a smaller number, you can use three. If you're working with a larger number like me, you can use five. But you can customize that here. And once you click Apply, it's going to go through. It's going to process all of those images. I'm not going to make you guys wait through this because it's not something that you necessarily need to watch. Um, But you have that function here. And that's one of those things that I feel like people don't know about Browse. Browse has a lot of these like secret hidden powers that people don't know about. Um, So hopefully, I'm pointing some things out that you guys didn't know about. So rename your files, you can do that all here, Um, and it's really awesome. So once you do, they'll all get automatically renamed, all your files will be in here, and you'll have access to them in their correct names. Now, one of the things that you might be asking at this point, besides the fact that you might think that I'm organizationally over the top, is how I keep track of all of this. And this is something that came to me about a year and a half ago, year and a half ago, about, Um, It was sometime after one of my big weddings at the beginning of last summer in like April and I realized that I was having a really hard time keeping track of a lot of the things that I had. Um, A lot of the clients that I had, all of their information for things like passwords for their private websites. Um, I couldn't remember what some of the slugs for their file names were so I wasn't finding things very easily. So I created this thing called the client information sheet and I was going to open it up and show it to you guys so that you could see this. And you can create your own version of this. It's all going to be dependent on what you think works best. So please feel free to customize this in any way that you want. Um, This information sheet is what I use to keep track of my clients. And this is not the one that I have. I actually print mine out and put them in a binder because I'm old school like that. You can keep this as a PDF on your computer, but I highly recommend that you keep a print version because heaven only knows what's going to happen. Um, in 10 years, and maybe that's me being uh, overprotective of my files, but I like having things in two different places. Um, Most of my photos are backed up on three different hard drives. I know exactly where all of my wedding files are, and as you can tell, I'm definitely an organizational freak. So this information sheet I keep in a binder, but I wanted to uh, show you guys a version of it on my computer and what I do. Every single client that hires me even if it's clients that I'm doing uh, work for free. So I do senior photos for uh, foster kids in Portland, and that's one of the things that has been something that I've done in the last year or so, and it's two years now, and it's really, really fun. They don't pay me anything, but I still keep them in here. So it's really important to me that I have access to not just clients that pay me, but also clients that I'm working with that might be for free. Um, It's the name of the client, the type, of client, so senior, wedding, portrait. You'll notice that there are a couple different categories for portrait. There's horse and person. I do a lot of horse and people portraits, so there's a reason why that's a category for me. Um, I don't do a ton of studio portraits, but that sample is down there. Um, I do the file name sample here, so this is just an example of what the file name might be. You'll notice a couple of them have a few different options. So you'll see under Megan C, that was the horse portraits I was showing you earlier. I photographed her with two different horses, so that's both of their names, so that I can see if I'm looking for one or the other. Um, This is their URL slug, their private gallery on my website. 
If they have a password, I make sure that I list that. Some clients request a private gallery because they don't want their photos seen. Um, this KYDJ company shoot that I was showing you earlier of the guys who wanted the 80s photos, um, this is really private to them because one of the guys doesn't know that they're going to be printing this out really big and putting it on their wall. And uh, so they wanted a private gallery just to make sure that he couldn't stumble upon it on my website. Um, I make sure that I get model release assigned for all the clients that I have and then which hard drives they're on. Um, you can customize this any way that you want and I'm more than happy to let you steal this. So if you want access to this sheet, let me know. I have it as a, I keep it as a pages file. And it's really easy to create this, you guys. You could do this on your own. So if you write down all of these categories, you can make this in five seconds. Um, so this client info sheet is really, really helpful. I have about seven of them in my binder and every single one of them is full up to this point because it's clients going all the way back to when I was I finally put this together about a year and a half ago, but I had all the client information and I compiled it and I have information for my clients going back about seven years. Um, so just in case anybody comes back and they want information about their photos, I organized the crap out of it and made sure that I know where they are. Um, again, it might be overkill, but it, to me it's really important that I know all of this. Awesome. Um, definitely. Um, we are getting a lot of questions. People are asking if they'll have access to these documents you have been showing. So I think that we can make that happen. We'll have this. This is actually being recorded, so it'll be posted later on our website, and we'll include any kind of companion documents that she's covering. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I have PDF. Obviously, this PDF is filled, um, so I won't give you guys this one or the one that has my name at the bottom. You can customize that on your own. But I'm more than happy to create a PDF or uh, a Word document that you guys have access to um, because this, this client info sheet, along with many of the other intake sheets that I have now, I didn't bring a lot of those with me because many of them are personal to my business. Um, Side note, if you're working with animals, they're technically considered property here in Oregon and Washington. And so instead of getting model releases, you actually need property releases for animals. And that's one of the big things that I learned last year when I had a client who was upset that I posted a photo of their horse on my website. Um, even though it was in a private gallery, she didn't like the fact that I put it up there and threatened to sue. I had to take everything down and I realized that the model release covers the people and not the horses. Um, so property releases is one of the intake forms that I have when I'm working with horse or animal clients. Um, so I have a ton of intake forms, but this one that I just showed you, this client info sheet, hands down is the most important that I, I own to this day, outside of model releases. Um, this is hugely helpful for finding all of your files and your information. Okay, so we're gonna kinda move on past the sheet so that you guys don't have to uh, keep hearing me talk about all of my nerdy files that I like to fill out, a lot of documents. Um, I want to jump on to ratings. Ratings and labels are customizable to you and everyone has a different system. I really like to argue, I don't think my dad is listening, I don't think that he's here. Um, my father used to work for On One and he sometimes likes to sneak in on webinars and watch me. Um, but I don't think he's here today which is really nice. We have gotten into many arguments about what way we like to label and rate our files. And every photographer I work with has a different idea of what they want. Uh, this girl that I'm mentoring, she's a PSU photography student right now, and I've been helping her learn how to edit a little bit better. I taught her my rating system, and two weeks later, she's already created her own. So she uses labels, and I use stars. And it's completely different, but for her, it makes perfect sense. I taught her the base of the system, she understood it, and she took off from there. So we're going to go over just kind of the basics of how this works. You'll notice a lot of these files have stars. Um, up in the top left-hand corner of the thumbnails, you can see the star rating, and then this little blank square is going to be your label. And if you didn't know that already, that's what those two are. Yay! Um, you can add star ratings and label ratings by clicking the numbers on your keyboard. So one through five is going to be one through five of your stars. And then if you go through and open up this label menu, you'll see six through zero represent colors. Um, some people see better with colors. Some people see better with the physical number that relates to the physical star, whatever works for you. Um, when I'm working with weddings, for instance, all of my files have a one star that I know I really like. And then anything that requires 
heavier retouching. So that means if I'm going to be going into portrait or if I have to do some like crazy retouching and combine a lot of photos, those files get a two star. That means that they have to be edited first because I need to go through and I need to manually edit them by hand. I batch process 85% of my wedding files which granted, when you're looking at the amount of wedding files I produce, that's still a lot, but 85% of my wedding files are batch processed. Um, the other, like, 15% are hand edited, and most of those are bridal party shots that are really, really important, and they'll have two stars because I know that those have to be done first before I run them through my preset. So if you don't like the star system, uh, the system that my little photography mentor started using is the red, yellow, green system, which I thought was very cute. It's her stoplight. Um, red means that she needs to stop and edit that photo right away. Yellow means that it needs to be edited, but it's not a priority. And green means that it's ready to go and it's already been processed through her preset. I thought it was a really cute idea. It's the same thing that I'm doing, except she just used colors instead of stars. Um, you'll notice that all of the files that are starred here in this folder so far, they're decoration photos. They don't require a lot of editing. I'm going to batch process them with a preset, so I don't need to spend the time manually editing any of these. Um, I, I almost never edit manually edit decoration photos. There's, there's no real point. Um, they're supposed to show the ambiance of the day, and every once in a while, if there's, this is a really good example, if there's a person in the corner, I might edit that out, but honestly, I think it kind of gives it character. So this might be something that I would leave in because, honestly, it, it really doesn't detract from the photo itself. Um, when you're working with large photo shoots like weddings, again, thousands and thousands of photos, you can't nitpick. And this has been my biggest problem, so please know that you are in a world of uh, happy company here. I want to nitpick and edit every single photo. I would like to see you do that in three weeks with 675 photos because trust me, unless you don't sleep and unfortunately don't have other jobs like I do, um, I work a lot of jobs and I'm very busy and uh, I, I don't have time to hand edit 675 photos. That's insane. Um, I did try for like two years. I thought that that was how you did wedding photography and now I've learned a little bit better. Um, so. I don't go through and do that. So it's really, really important that you guys let some things go. There are going to be a lot of photos that are going to need some help, and that's part of the reason why you're working on weddings. You choose, let's say you're looking at two photos, or you're looking at a series of photos, and you need to go through, and I need to find a photo of the uh, reception space. I don't need all of them. I need to go through, find the one that's the best, straight out of camera, and that's going to be the one that I use. This is not a good one. It's way too dark. The light is way too bright. It doesn't look very good. I'm just going to reject this one and move on. These two are a little bit lighter. This one's crooked, probably not going to use it. This one's a little bit better. That's a maybe. And I go through and if it's blurry, if it's too dark, if it doesn't look very good, if it just doesn't seem as sharp, if there are people in the way, I reject it and move on. Out of 6,000 photos, if I give my clients 500 of them and I go through and I've looked and edited most of those, that's a pretty impressive number. Um, and when you think about that, it's really important that you, you give yourself some slack. There's going to be a lot of photos that you're like, oh, I could just fix that. Or if you're looking on Facebook and you're part of like a Facebook group or you're looking at 500 pixels and you're like, wow, that wedding photo is amazing. I could make that happen. You can't do that with 600 photos. Um, so you, you have to get pretty ruthless about what you like and what you don't like. Um, so for these clients that I eventually, uh, these clients already have their photos. I lied to you, this, uh, this photo sheet was actually taken last year. These are straight off of my uh, original file drive that I keep at home. Um, out of all of these photos, I think they got about 10 decoration photos. And there's quite a few in this folder. There's about 122 altogether. But you'll notice that I took many of these images in sequences. I chose one out of the sequence, I edited that, I moved on. Choose one out of the sequence, edited that, and moved on. So when you're working with big shoots, get ruthless. It's okay to not like something. Um, it's okay to say that I could fix that, but it's not really a great capture. I take a lot of crappy photos at weddings, guys. Just heads up. Um, so that's just one of the last things that I'll say about organizing here is keep it simple. 
Uh, keep it ruthless when you're working with a lot of photos. Um, I have a little post-it note on the bottom of my uh, iMac at home that has my rating system so that I'm looking through a folder and I can't figure out whether I liked that photo or not. Um, and I can't remember what that star or rating means, I have a little post-it note that has my information on it. And there's a couple of shoots that I do use, that little red, yellow, green label system, because I was trying it out because I thought that it was so cute that she came up with that on her own. Um, she's like 19 and she's the sweetest person in the world, so I think that it was really adorable that she like went out and was like, I'm going to make my own rating system. Uh, I want to be my my own woman, and I was like, heck yeah. So I stole her rating system, and I've been trying to use it, and so I have little little notes on the bottom of my computer that give me that information. Um, I also, because that's how I roll, I also have a printed version of all of the information that I use in my rating systems and my retouching systems. I have those in all of my notebooks. Um, I literally just photocopied those post-it notes and uh, punched them into my binder so that I would have a hard copy in there, because that's where I keep all of my work documents. Um, so. That's going to be kind of the end of the organizing part. I want to jump into editing really, really quickly. Uh, this is not a hugely uh, editable editing. This is not a very uh, specific editing webinar. Um, obviously, if you have more questions about editing, I'm more than happy to ask them. But I wanted to show you guys in real time what it's like to edit as a wedding photographer. Or, again, any other type of photographer. It doesn't just have to be weddings. Um, so the way that I edit is once my files are organized, so in these, these folders, all of the files are going to be in their categories. So there's subfolders, bridal party, ceremony, all that. Um, and then all of the files are renamed. So if we jump into the getting ready category, these have all been renamed because I went ahead and did that before in the webinar. Um, I'm ready to edit these. Uh, for now, let's just say that they've all been starred. I started with the original files that I pulled off of my hard drive. You guys, that's why these are not uh, starred. Um, these clients already have their photos. So don't freak out. I'm not like, oh my god, these are new and I'm not giving my clients my photos. Um, so all of these images are ready to go. They've been rated, they've been renamed, they're in their subcategories, they're backed up on multiple hard drives, and I'm, I'm happy. When you're editing and you're going through, one of the things that can be helpful if you want to pay a little bit of attention to the types of presets that you're going to be creating when you're working on photos that are indoors, a lot of times if you're shooting with a, a really high ISO, I like to just automatically go to black and white. It's classic for wedding photography, it's really easy to process, and a lot of times the clients really like it, so it's a win-win for everybody. If you're dealing with natural light, you can do a little bit of both, you can mix it up. Most categories, like this getting ready category, I have two different presets that I use. I have a black and white and a color. I can edit them as I will, but for the most part, they're great all around uh, useful presets. And it'll depend on the lighting and what situation I'm giving. given. Reception photos are almost always shot indoors, unfortunately, and so most of the time I have one black and white preset that I use for the indoor shots, and then sometimes I'll have a color preset for the flash photos that I take when everybody's dancing and acting crazy but that's pretty much it. Um, a lot of times I'll just batch process everything with that black and white preset, and the reception folder is one of my favorites because it goes really quickly. It's like, bam, out the door, we're done. Um, getting ready and the bridal party shots I s spend a lot more time on. Um, so all that to say, each one of these files is going to go into, uh, a s into effects and they're going to get processed, but we need to actually create the presets ahead of time, and so you can do that in whatever way you find works best for you. Um, I like to take one sample photo that I think is really good, that doesn't need a ton of work, and I like to put that in effects, and I like to see where I'm at. Don't choose a problem photo. This happens all the time. People will go through and they'll choose a photo that's really, really dark, this photo is blurry, but just go with it. They'll choose a photo that's really dark. I took a photo that was supposed to be a silhouette of her maid of honor. I actually ended up really liking this photo, but it's going to require a little bit more special editing. Really, really bad photo to choose for creating a batch processing preset. Really bad. Um, a photo that might potentially be blown out. Obviously, again, it's blurry, but you can see the example here. It's super bright. I would have to tone this down quite a bit 
not very good for creating a batch processing preset. So think about that when you're creating your presets is you need to test it out on one or two photos and make sure that it's actually working the way that you want it. Um, this photo is good because it's got light areas and dark areas, so it'll be a good uh, sample of a lot of the photos that I took with this lighting in this setting. And you're more than welcome to check out things like the information of how I shot this photo. I could check that out and say, you know what, this photo and the next 20 photos can all be batch processed with the same preset, but I might need to readjust. If you're like me and you like to wing it, you don't have to look at the, the metadata and the information for these files, but it, for some people who are more technologically inclined and really care about that information, the metadata can be awesome. All the photos that were shot at a specific ISO, um, you can go through and you can edit all of those the same. So whatever your criteria is, that can be really important to you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take this file into effects. I'm going to start out just by creating a copy for now. And one of the things that I am going to put out here. Um, the files that I produce for web and print are JPEGs. Your clients, 99.9% .9 of the time, do not know the difference between file types. They don't know that all of the things that we know as photographers, that printing with TIFFs is actually better, and when you process all these different files, you're degrading, and JPEGs can be really bad, and all this stuff. They don't give a crap. They just want to print their photos, um, or they just want to upload their photos to Facebook. Um, when I'm editing my files, I keep them as PSD or TIFF files. That's a really good way for me to indicate that these are my editing files. If it's a JPEG, it's ready to go to client. So this is a good way for me to be able to tell what files are still mine that still need work. They're a TIFF or a, JPEG, or a Photoshop file. And then files that are ready to go to my clients are JPEGs. This is, this is my personal way of doing it. I really like using Photoshop files. If I need to go into Photoshop and do a lot of advanced retouching on an image, this is going to give me that ability if I need to. I don't for this file. I'm probably going to save it as a TIFF, but if you want that option, it's there. So this is a good way to differentiate between what goes to a client and what doesn't. These are still working files. JPEG is your finished file. Um, you're, you're more than welcome to yell at me about that all you want. Um, but that's how I roll. Um, and I have never had a client once complain. I have never had a client ask me for different photos, except once I had a photographer who asked me for the negatives of film that I shot at a wedding. Other than that, don't, most of my clients do not care. Um, they just want their files and they just want to print them quickly. So um, color space, I'm not going to talk about because there's a lot of arguments about what color space to use. I'm going low and simple for this so that you guys don't have to worry about this long conversation. Um, so this is going to be my full-sized edit file. Keeping it as a PSD or a TIFF allows me to edit it later if I need to, add more edits, make all of those adjustments, and save it as an edit. Um, so we're going to go ahead and click OK. We're going to jump into effects really quickly. And we're not going to do a ton of editing here in effects. I already talked to you guys about things like separating all of the related files. So your reception, um, creating your dark inside preset, your flash inside preset, all of those are going to be really helpful. Um, we're starting with our one file here. You'll see this is my laptop computer. I don't do a ton of uh, wedding edits on this computer. I have a lot of basic wedding presets that I transferred over here for you guys, but my large computer at home, which was in the slideshow that you saw, has all of the different wedding preset categories. I've just combined them all in a wedding folder because I, this computer is too slow and too old um, to do a lot of wedding editing here. Um, but you will notice that there is a category here called Silverwind. That's the farm uh, that I take pictures of horses at, and I keep all of those presets in a different category. Um, I have my wedding presets. If I ever need to access them, they're in here, and I've got a couple more that I've created that are specific to me. Um, I keep most of the ones on this computer in a folder called Liz's Projects, and that's where I find most of the presets that I need. Now, when you're making presets for weddings, I, I can't tell you how much I need to reiterate this, Keep it simple. Keep it so, so simple. Your clients do not care about all of these crazy um, presets that you want to create and all of these crazy like vintage styles. They want simple, simple, simple. If you go through and you look at my wedding category, they're all really close 
They're very similar. Um, a lot of times I use a wedding preset from one client, I adjust it for my new client, and I move on. Um, that's how easy it is. So a lot of times I'll go through my old wedding folders and I'll say, you know what, I really like this one right here. This black and white is really nice. Or if I scroll down and I really like this color film look, I've been using it a lot. I'm just going to click on that and I'm going to start there. Now, when you're creating these presets, I just wanted to show you guys my basic um, stack here. It's almost always the same. Color enhancer, tone enhancer. If I'm creating a vintage look, it's a split tone. Or if I'm not creating a vintage look, it's a sunshine layer to add that kind of warmth and contrast. And dynamic contrast. That really is it. And almost all of these you're going to see are pretty similar. It's going to be color enhancers and tone enhancers. It's going to be some dynamic contrast. There's the sunshine. Sometimes I'll add a vignette depending on the photo. It's pretty much it. Um, I don't want to go through how I edit each one of these. Um, this really is about kind of the process of all of this. So once I've created a preset, one of the things that you can do, I'm just going to save this in a new category. Even though it's exactly the same, I'm going to save it in a new category because that is how organized and specific I am about this. Uh, I'm going to go up to the preset drop down menu and choose save preset. In the category, I'm going to add a new category and we're going to call this A and B because that's their wedding slug. We'll call it a wedding category. We'll click OK. And then we're going to go ahead and call this getting ready color film. Um, once I've created that and the category is ready to go, I'll know exactly where to find that preset. I don't have to hunt in this huge wedding folder of presets that I've saved as starting points. I like this, I'm putting it in their folder and I'm ready to go. Um, a lot of times what I do if I make no adjustments here is I actually cancel out of this, um, which many of you guys are going to be like, what? I don't care about that edit that I just created. I just want to batch process all of these files. I want them to be done. So I don't need to save that edit that I just worked on. It's going to be batch processed, let's say, with all of these files here. And I'm ready to export from here. Um, so don't save that file. If you like the preset and you're good to go and you know that the next, uh, let's say, 120 of these files, you know, there's 149 images in here. I think I processed about 40 for the getting ready. So let's say all of those 40 files, I know that I want that same color film preset because I really like it. I'm going to select all of them and export from there. So I want this process to be as simple and streamlined as possible. Um, so I don't want some lingering weird PSD file in this folder here. I want all of my edits, whether I need to edit them more later, if I need to crop them or do any other information with them, I want them all processed with this preset and I want them to go in a new edit folder. So you might think it's a little strange, but that's one of the reasons why I don't save that edit. I look at the preset, I check it out, and I'm good to go. Uh, one of the other things that's really great before I kind of let you guys go is when you're exporting your files and you're using a preset from Perfect Effects, there's a button on the right-hand side in the little effects dialog, if you will, that says pause on first image, and it allows you to go through and say that you want to look at your image and how the preset is looking with that file before you export it. So in the Export Resize drop-down menu, if you choose Effects Preset, which we're going to go ahead and do, uh, there is AB Wedding, because it starts with A, so it's going to be the first one that pops up. There's Getting Ready Color Film, Pause on First Image. A lot of times it'll actually choose a photo from the, the set that you've selected from random, which is actually great. Choose a random photo, see how it looks. If it's really not looking that good, cancel and try a new preset. Um, but this gives you the ability to be like, you know what, that preset might have been a little too dark. So let me go through and lighten it up a little bit. Or, you know, the dynamic contrast is way too intense, and it'll probably be too intense on some of these photos of the wedding dress. So I'm going to lower that a little bit. So this gives you a chance to edit that preset just a little bit before you apply it if you need to. Um, when you're in the export menu too, before I answer some questions, this preset drop-down menu is where you go through and you save uh, a new preset with your current settings. The ones that I was showing you in the slideshow are on my home computer. This is my laptop computer, and so I don't have any presets saved on here. I don't edit on this computer very often. Um, 
this is mostly my other work computer. Um, but I can go through and once I've selected all of the different parts of my export and resize, I can go through and I can save this as a preset just by selecting that option. So, all right. I think you guys probably have uh, listened to me talk about my nerdy organizational tactics for way too long. We're at 1055. And I wanted to see if anybody had any questions um, and see if anyone had any conversations that they wanted to start about organizational tactics inside of On One Photo 10. So Great. I'm going to pass it off to Nathan and see Great. if there are any. Yeah, awesome Great. presentation. Um, <laughs> we're, we are getting some questions. And for anybody that was looking for some more editing uh, of photos themselves, Liz has some really awesome videos on our website that Yay. you can check out. Um, I've actually included a link in the um, chat window there to Liz's author page on the On One blog. That's where all her videos are. She has a really great one that kind of kind of covers everything she talked about today and does a little more editing with. In so go ahead and check out that it's the uh, engagement photo shoot video. I think it's got over like 25,000 views. It's, it's a really awesome video. Um, as far as questions about the presentation, Liz, um, again, just to reiterate, this is all being recorded and it will be posted online later. And we will do our best to get those documents she talked about downloadable as well. So you have some companions documents to go with this presentation. Um, back to the topic though. A lot of, few questions about um, just like kind of where the files were stored, Liz. You, you showed how you organized everything, and I noticed that it was in the blank slate. Maybe you can help explain to people that under, don't understand that import to the hard drive or external hard drive process where actually physically your files are stored. Yeah, so one of the things, if you guys noticed in that, um, that client info sheet, you guys can, I'm, you can still see my screen, right? We're good. Right, yeah. I'm like showing the info sheet and I'm like, I hope everybody can see it. Um, you'll notice that I have hard drives as the last category there. I have a lot of hard drives, you guys. Um, I have a Synology system, which um, I won't go into. Um, it's very awesome and is like 26 terabytes and it's crazy. Um, I have that at home and that's where I keep a large amount of the files that are really important that need backups. I keep most of my original files on there, things that are really important. Uh, but I also have a ton of these little portable hard drives, which is what this, this one that I was working off today called Blank Slate. Um, and so this category right here is super important for me accessing my files later. Now that said, when I plug my camera into my computer, so just like I have it set up right now, this is my laptop, I take it everywhere I go, I take it to work with me, all that kind of stuff. Um, when I plug my camera into here, if I have room on my computer, a lot of times I'll import it straight to my desktop. It's the fastest way to import your files. When you're importing onto a hard drive that's plugged into your computer, like this blank slate dude right here, it can actually take a little bit longer. Because if you think about it, it's your files are going from the camera to your computer and then your computer to a hard drive and it's it's a it's an extended step so I actually keep a lot of space on my desktop and I actually create a, a folder so let's say I just did a wedding um, it's for this couple called Matt and Fawn and so I'll create Matt and Fawn wedding on my desktop and then I'll plug my camera in from there and start uploading files using my image capture. So if you're in image capture right here, you'll see devices is where your camera would show up. And once you have your files selected down at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to select the folder that you want to put your images in. And I'll select this Matt and Fawn wedding. Once this is filled up with photos, I go through and I create my subfolders. So there's going to be things like ceremony and I'll create that. And I can actually do this while they're importing, so you don't have to do it all at once. We'll create a bridal party. One of the things that they did is they had a photo booth, so I'll type in photo booth. So I'll have all my different categories here. I go through and I put all of my images in their respective categories, which I'm going to give you guys a heads up. If you're working with a lot of photos, it can take a little bit of time, um, especially if uh, it helps if you separate everything by time. But um, 
because the ceremony, it's like there's a start and a finish. Really easy to put in there. Photo booth, really easy to find because I basically took all the photos back to back right next to each other. But the photo booth was also intermixed with the reception, so I have to go through and separate those. Once everything is in their categories and then I've renamed my files, I take this large giant folder, the Matt and Fawn wedding folder, and I copy it to whichever hard drive I'm going to be backing it up on. Um, when cool. I'm doing this at home, I'm working for photos off of my actual large iMac computer because it's huge and has a ton of space on it, but I keep all of my backups on my Synology hard drive at home. Um, so that's kind of how I roll. You can also just start off by putting this folder just straight on your hard drive. So if you've got a portable hard drive and that's where you keep all of your photo shoot photos, um, create that folder right on your hard drive and go from there. Um, the best part is if you keep it right here and eventually you want to move this folder into things like, you'll see I have a photos folder, I can pop that in there eventually. Um, but that's that's pretty much, hopefully that answers that question. I put it straight on my desktop because I keep my desktop very clean. Um, there is nothing on there that does not need to be there, and I do not keep excess photos specifically on this computer um, because it's small and crappy and old. And even my large uh, iMac, I don't keep a ton of photos that I'm not working on unless it's current. In the last two months, they're not on my computer. So I always have space to import my new photo shoots from there. And Liz, what do you do in case uh, in the event something ever happened to that hard drive, uh, your external hard drive, you know, natural so, disaster or something? Oh, so you guys are probably going to laugh at me for this, but I, I learned this trick, actually, um, from my boyfriend, who is a writer, and he likes to handwrite everything. He's handwriting a book right now, and I think it's insane. So... He's a writer, and he's petrified that the, the handwritten pages that he has before he types them in are going to get burned. He introduced me to this line of um, fireproof containers, and that's what he keeps all of his writing materials in. I actually bought one of the boxes online for like 100 it was an investment. It was like 150 bucks, and it was huge. And it's a fireproof container that you can keep in your home. And I guarantee that if you type in like fireproof container for home on Google, you're going to find a whole bunch of options. Because as you've seen on the news recently, there have been a ton of forest fires this summer, especially in California, and people are losing things that they want. And it doesn't just include photos and you know your social security cards and you know your documents for your home. It also includes things like this. To me, these hard drives are more important than anything else that I own. I would literally be okay if you burned most of the things that I own as long as I had my hard drives. So I bought a fireproof container that I keep them in and I also make sure that I have all of my files backed up on multiple drives. So I never just have a file on my computer ever. It automatically gets backed up to at least one drive and probably two. Um, and especially when I'm working with clients that don't have their images yet, I'm very specific about the fact that I want them to feel secure that their photos are, are safe. Um, when clients get their photos, a lot of times I back that down and I only have it backed up on my very large Synology hard drive. Um, the other thing is a lot of people are using cloud services nowadays. I think that unless you have the best interconnection, internet connection in the world, it's really tough to upload 6,000 raw files and all of their edits to a server. But if you have fast internet and you have a secret that I don't know about, that's a good option too. Um, because then if your entire house burns down and your fireproof container didn't exist, um, they would exist in the cloud somewhere. Yeah. So, I only keep yeah. the uh, photos that are near and dear to me on the, in the cloud just in case. But uh, I think that's it. We're getting a lot of questions, Liz, about uh, what your workflow is going to be like with On One Photo Raw coming up. And uh, I think we might have to have you back here <laughs> to do one this fall after it's released with On One Photo Raw. I think that's a very good idea. And it's going to change a little bit. That's one of the things that's really important. Um, and I saw, I was creeping in the questions. It's been a while since I've done a webinar for you guys. Um, so I kind of forgot that there was the questions panel. I kind of just like went off and uh, uh, just kept on going. And I noticed that there were a whole bunch of questions about like when I add in things like Lightroom or when I add in Photoshop. Lightroom and Photoshop are their own unique categories and conversations. Um, the, when I use Photoshop is when I was talking about my editing process and those two start images that need retouching, if they need a lot of advanced retouching, that's when I'm going to go into 
Photoshop. Um, if I know I have to do a lot of work on a photo to make it really great, I'm going to need to go into Photoshop. And so that, that, that happens sometimes. Um, I don't like to because it takes up too much time. Uh, again, I feel like if you if you haven't done a wedding, you guys, you haven't done a full wedding of like 200 people and huge families and all that, thousands of images, thousands. And clients want their photos in like three weeks, which if you're editing all those photos by hand, let me just say, that's insane. Um, and by yourself. I work alone. I don't have an assistant. I don't have uh, someone who helps me edit my files. I do everything by hand by myself. Um, and I don't go into Photoshop with weddings much anymore. Ever. Um, it's either Lightroom or On One. On One has the best batch processing presets I have ever used. I've tried other programs, they don't work. Um, and I, I, I don't get what I need in Lightroom. And so batch processing in On One is what I use for, again, like 85% of my images are just automatically batched through On One. Um, and then if anything needs extra help, I will add it into. Photoshop. But the on one raw is going to change everything because we're going to be able to access a lot of those quick edits really, really quickly. And we're going to be able to batch a lot of those very simple edits like exposure, contrast, and things like that without having to go into effects. And that's going to completely change the way that we deal with our workflow. Um, so hopefully this helps for now. And hopefully I can come back later and talk to you guys about how on one raw is going to change that. But from everything that I've seen and everything that I've read and watched from Dan, it's, it's going to be a game changer, which is really awesome. Definitely. We're all excited for it to come out. And I think that's pretty much it for the questions. Liz, if you have anything else you want to say before we close this webinar, again, I'm, I have recorded this. I will be posting it online as soon as possible uh, to our blog and the documents as well. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say, just because this is my, my brain going off, um, Really quickly, there was one other question about why I need mono releases for weddings, um, which I thought was a really good question that a lot of people don't know. If I want to be able to use my images and put photos of couples and their friends and family on my website, I need mono releases from my, from my two main clients. Um, and that's really important. I also have a contract, and the contract contains a model release. And if you're working with clients and if you're new to the photography business world, let me just say, contracts are really important um, and you need to make sure that you get that sorted out. There's a lot of information out on the web about this. There's a lot of contracts that you can download and model releases you can download to test, but I just want to make sure that I put that out there. You guys really got to make sure that you do your homework before you put photos up on the web. Um, I have had clients ask me to take photos down and it was before I started doing model releases and contracts. And now I have solid contracts and they are allowed to not sign a model release if they don't want their images, but I have to know that up front. Um, so just a little like serious business side of things. That's really, really important if you guys are going to be creating portfolios. Just because they're your friend and just because you might have known them does not mean that they are willing to let you put photos of their children, of their family, of their kids, of their animals, of their property online without releases. Um, so I have model releases for like my two best friends, which they jokingly signed for me, but I put them on there in case like anything happens. Um, so that's kind of my last little thing. Um, but outside of that, um, you can follow me on my website, elizabethlepage.com. There's a whole bunch of information on there. Uh, the best way to follow me is actually through my Instagram page. That's what I update the most, and I talk a lot about what I do, and I take a lot of pictures, and um, I exist in this world of photos, and as you can see, a lot of food. Um, but that's the best way to kind of figure out what's going on with me and any of the blog posts or any information about things like teaching and classes. If you guys are interested, you're more than welcome to just send me a note. Um, I do a lot of private Photoshop training. Um, I just did a class at uh, a foster care center, which was really fun for a whole bunch of teenagers. Um, and I got to teach them how to use Photoshop. So if you guys are interested in Photoshop training or on one training or Lightroom training or anything like that, um, feel free to send me a note because that's one of my main side businesses. And it's one of my, big passions. I love teaching people how to use their cameras and their computers. It's awesome. So that's pretty, that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Liz. And thank yeah. you everyone that joined us. Thank you guys. It was great to, it was great to be back and do a webinar. It's been a while. <laughs>